it's great to be here and it's great to see so many familiar faces and to be, you know, back at SEPA virtually. Um, what I wanted to do tonight was to, to make it really interactive. Um, so I'm not going to talk for, for super, super long. Um, but what I wanted to do was to throw out a, a question just sort of to get you thinking. And then I'll talk a little bit more um, about the book and the key concepts and you know, how the book came about. Um, and then I've got a bunch more questions that I'm going to be asking you as well as hopefully any questions that you have uh, for me in the conversation in the second half. So what I'd like to do to start out um, is if you could just put in the, uh, in the chat, what does risk mean to you? How do you define risk? So just throw that out there. You can think about it a little bit more if you want and, um, and I will just talk and then we'll, we'll come back to that in the discussion. Um, so um, You Are What You Risk is my new book. It's, it's uh, the, the art and science of, uh, how, how to, the new art and science of navigating an uncertain world. Um, very COVID relevant. I actually was, um, was supposed to finish the book last spring and then ended up doing a lot more reporting and a little bit of restructuring of the book because of the, uh, the momentous events. Um, but uh, I wanted to start actually a little bit before the book was written. Uh, my third book uh, was uh, The Gray Rhino, How to Recognize and Act on the Obvious Dangers We Ignore uh, that came out in 2016. And it's really about the question of why do some leaders see a big scary thing coming at them and do something about it? And some of them don't. And it, it came out of my work as a financial journalist uh, on the Argentinian debt crisis and later on a policy paper that I did uh, while I was running the World Policy Institute about the Greek debt crisis, which was one of the very early calls for a, a voluntary preemptive restructuring. And of course, Greece and its creditors came down to the, the last minute to avoid a default. And, and I wondered, you know, why did Argentina see a big problem coming? There was a public proposal uh, to, to do a restructuring of their debt like Greece did, and they didn't do it, and it was collapse. You know, 16 years of legal wrangling. And so that was really the question. Um, but I, I didn't think that everybody would get as excited about geeky sovereign debt questions as I was. And I also felt that this question was so, so much broader and so much more relevant for all sorts of issues than, than just debt. Uh, climate change is, uh, was a big one and it's, it's in both books and it's something I still talk about quite a bit and have, have done some advising of, uh, of governments on. Um, but also, you know, you know, business strategy issues, and, you know, digital disruption, uh, financial crisis goes through a lot of it because that's kind of what I love. Um, so the Gray Rhino came out and, in 2016, and the concept very quickly was embraced by the business continu continuity and disaster risk reduction communities, particularly in Europe. And in 2017, the book came out in China and, um, actually ended up crashing the Chinese stock market in summer of 2017. Uh, the Chinese government had a, a big, uh, a big financial, uh, national financial work conference is what they called it. It's a, a five year economic policy making meeting during which there was a lot of talk behind closed doors about gray rhinos, particularly around financial risk. Uh, you know, real estate prices, uh, aggressive corporate borrowing, uh, uh, new unregulated financial products, wealth management products where people were saying, oh, this is, you know, less risk and more reward and uh, you know, deceptive marketing practices and things like that. So uh, there was a front page editorial in People's Daily that said, uh, we need to watch out not just for the black swans that nobody can picture coming, uh, but for the gray rhinos, which is, are of course the, the obvious things that are coming at you and give a choice. And they listed five financial risk gray rhinos and uh, the next day, the markets fell by uh, five, about 5% 5 for the riskiest stock. So it was kind of a big deal. And uh, I've been back and forth to China several times, well, before last year, uh, talking about the concept um, and, and a five-stage framework that goes with it that helps people to analyze why they and other stakeholders are not necessarily doing as well as they could be in, uh, in dealing with, with something. So as I was going around the world, two very interesting things happened that are part of You Are What You Risk, which is very much a sequel. So the first thing was that I got a lot of pushback in the US. People got it you know, in specific areas in Europe and in China, 
I need an entourage when I go there. I mean, it's it's absolutely insane. The book's a, a big bestseller, has sold more than a quarter million copies, and it, people just absolutely get it. So everyone kept asking me, well, how come, how come they get it in Asia and they, you know, there's been so much pushback in the West? So I started thinking about that. And the other thing that happened was that I would do book talks, and this was all over the world, people would ask me, how do I apply this to my personal life? And I didn't know what to do with that at first because I'm a policy person and finance and business strategy and governance. And, and like, I don't do self-help books. And I really was struggling with it um, until I spoke with a close friend who was the CEO of a private equity firm uh, who said, Michelle, you know what? The personal bad risk decisions are more closely related to businesses than you would think. He said, we just reviewed our disappointing investments. And in every single one of them, the red flag was there. He says, but it wasn't the business model or the broader economy or, or the technology itself or the product. He said, in every single case, it was bad personal risk decisions by the CEO. It was the drunk driving, the domestic violence, the the speeding. And since then, there's actually been a lot of research confirming that there's a very strong uh, relationship. In fact, in the book, I cite the Ashley Madison, um, you know, cheating hack, you know, it's a, a dating website for people who want to, to cheat on their spouses. And uh, since that data was out there, some intrepid academics grabbed it and cross-referenced it against like securities violations and other things. And they actually saw a very strong correlation. And so I realized that there was this very close tie between individual risk behaviors and businesses. And also that the individual risk behaviors were so closely tied to the broader culture, to the national policies that were in place, this sort of you know, risk ecosystem, and that you couldn't separate these three. And so then I struggled because when you write books, you're supposed to put them in nice simple boxes that fit nicely on specific shelves, like the business shelf, the current affairs shelf, the self-help shelf. And um, I really struggled with it because I felt like there needed to be a conversation about how all these things work with each other. And so I finally, and this in, in itself was actually quite a big risk. I said, you know what, I'm just gonna do this. I, it's, it's sort of aimed at a business audience because I've got an audience uh, there, but it's not a business book. Um, and it's, it's something that all three of these, uh, these areas, so sort of, you know, government policy, business and organizations and individuals will find something in. And hopefully this will catalyze a, a conversation across these areas. It's, it's more of a, a complex systems thinking approach. So um, these, these two questions really led me to write this book, the sort of you know, China versus the West and the, the connection between individual personal risk decisions. You know, the people who see the gray rhinos coming and do something and the ones who don't. And so what I ended up doing was pulling together a lot of very, very different disciplines from uh, psychology, sociology, social psychology, some, you know, organizational theory. Um, and, you know, looked also a lot at some, um, you know, political science and, uh, and you know, people who were analyzing countries, all sorts of things, kind of pull them together. These even a little bit of etymology because how people talk about risk in different places and different professions is completely different. It's like not even the same conversation. And I also found, particularly talking to some of the business continuity or the, the financial risk, disaster risk reduction professionals, they were completely obsessed with these questions that, that kept them up at night, but they, they had trouble talking to the other people in the organization. And of course, if you just keep risk in a, in a silo, then the people who need to be doing the most to prevent the risks from turning into calamities uh, aren't going to be on your side. So I really wanted to create a, a tool. Uh, so You Are What You Risk provides uh, a bunch of tools in that sense and, and a real vocabulary. Uh, the central concept is a risk fingerprint. And you can see on the, on the cover of the book, there's a, a fingerprint that's in the shape of a maze. And my point is, is actually very simple. It's that the risk choices that you make leave an imprint that identifies you to the world as clearly as a fingerprint on a glass at a crime scene. Um, that, that if you wanna know who someone is, look at the risk choices 
that they've made and that tells you who they are. And on the other side, you know, the, the, the finger itself is a very interesting set of both fixed and changeable things. There's the, there's the genetics of your internal, your, your innate personality, who you are, how methodical or how impulsive you are in making risk decisions, how anxious or how calm you are. Uh, and those are the kinds of things that's very hard to change. I actually looked at the, the relationship between genetics and risk. Uh, they think there might be something of a connection between you know, dopamine receptors, but it's, it's all very controversial. So you've got this innate thing. And then you have your experiences, you know, how you were raised, the example that that was set, um, the, the people around you, the expectations of you, the broader cultural expectations, you know, if, if risk taking and failure are seen as okay or not, uh, the attitude of society towards you know, individualism or collectivism. Very, very interesting research around that, that uh, depending on whether you're an individualist or collectivist culture, uh, your behavior as, as a single person making a risk decision is different from what you might decide when you are in a group. Uh, also habits. If you think about you know, people who use lots of nice shea butter lotion on their hands, have super smooth fingerprints uh, versus people who are doing manual labor, the very same thing is true with the habits that you develop uh, about risk, how aware you are of the risks that you're taking, how aware you are of the environment, of the, uh, you know, the social cir circumstances, your peers very much influence your decisions, uh, even weird neurobiological things that you might not have thought about. Uh, if you have spicy food for lunch for a few hours afterwards, you actually uh, become more risk seeking than you were before which blows me away. If the temperature is colder, you're going to be more risk seeking. So, you know, I tell people, if you want, uh, you know, if you want to go ask your boss for a raise, go to a Thai restaurant, order the spiciest food, tell them to crank down the, the AC and, and music also, the, depending on the, the tempo, faster tempo music makes you more likely to take risks as well. So there are all of these decisions that we make with these neurobiological influences that we haven't even thought about. Um, a lot of risk decisions we don't even think about in a risk lens. Every decision is actually pretty much a risk. It's, you know, is this going to work out or is that, you know, every choice is a risk. Every risk is a choice. And once you start looking at the decisions that you make through a risk lens, it gives you an incredibly powerful set of insights into yourself, uh, into the kinds of changes you might make to your behavior, uh, you know, the, the kinds of people you have around you. Uh, the kind of company you work, uh, if you work at a, in a big traditional legacy firm where the biggest risk is not doing things the way we've always done them, uh, or if you're at a startup where it's like, you know, move fast and break things, and uh, people might be a little bit, bit too, uh, too risk friendly in some cases. Um, and again, what you, what you have for lunch uh, and the kind of consultation you seek before you look for risks, uh, people on boards. Very interesting, uh, this, um, there's a tool called the Risk Type Compass developed in the UK uh, for measuring your risk personality. And they've, they've surveyed uh, probably over 20,000 people at this point. And they found that when they do this with a board and they do a scatter plot of all of the, the risk attitudes of the, the people in the room, they find that the people who are in a similar place have similar risk attitudes actually often sit next to each other in the room. It's absolutely fascinating. And people ask me all the time if there is a, an ideal risk fingerprint. And I don't think there is, but I think there is an ideal alignment between how aware you are of your risk fingerprint and if the circumstances that you're in, the job that you've taken, the risks that you are taking, if those align with really how your, you know, how your relationship with risk is, and that you can certainly optimize. Uh, this is as true for, for organizations and societies. We've seen over the past year with all of the risk decisions around COVID that different countries have taken very, very different decisions, have very, very different attitudes towards risks. 
uh, last uh, last spring, in the early days of the pandemic, there were all of these triumphalist headlines in Western papers about how, oh, democracies are so much better that this happened in China because, because of their system of government. And then, of course, you know, a year later, we see what's uh, what's happened in democracies, and, uh, and and the line is really not between democracies or not. It's between how aware countries are of risk. Uh, it's between the decisions that they're willing to make to reduce risk, and it's about citizens' attitudes towards themselves. And again, people say, what's the best? And uh, there, it depends on the measure. It could be you know, the number of deaths or the economic impact. You can look at those and compare them, but you look at say Sweden, which early on made a decision uh, to, to be more lax about social distancing and, and rules and things like that, uh, in theory to, to keep the economy going better. And uh, you know, it didn't turn out as well, but it was a choice that they made. Trust is a big part of it too. And uh, apparently Sweden's decision was also because they trusted their citizens to behave certain ways. And that didn't always turn out the way they thought. Similarly, there's some research that came out of Singapore saying that people trusted the government so much that they weren't doing enough as individuals. So that the government had to put in place stricter rules than it had originally because people weren't taking enough responsibility for themselves. And, and so a discussion about risk in a certain uh, community, country, or culture also has to do with collective attitudes about who's responsible for what. And throughout my career in policy, it's always driven me, driven me absolutely bonkers when people get into this binary debate about government, private sector, government, private sector. And they're not mutually exclusive. They, they need to work together. Or in climate change, my, my big pet peeve, I kind of rant about this, so sorry for subjecting to you, you to this again, but um, a lot of people come out and say, okay, well, what can I do? I'm gonna eat less meat. I'm gonna turn down the temperature in winter and turn it up in, uh, in summer. I'm gonna take public transportation. All these little behavioral things that people can do that research has shown can actually reduce greenhouse gases by between 20% and uh, 37%, you know, depending on how many people adopt these behaviors. But then you get these, these climate journalists who come out and say, oh, you're suckers if you're doing that and you're also letting government and private sector and big companies off the hook by doing this. And again, it's, it's not mutually exclusive. You know, if, if companies see that people are doing these behaviors, that there's a demand for more sustainable products and that you know, people wanna be sure that it's done without greenwashing, then that's going to change their behaviors. And if governments see that people want certain things, they're gonna change their policies as well. And so you really need all three, the citizens, private sector, and the government to work together to reduce these risks but that relationship is, is, is badly broken right now. We're seeing a lot of, of political tensions, a lot of social tensions, and a lot of conversations really about what's the appropriate risk umbrella that countries should be providing to people, whether that is you know, involving you know, rules for people who don't wanna follow public safety guidelines or uh, you know, public, public health being provided you know, publicly, um, you know, what kind of social safety nets, uh, what kind of support is appropriate. I mean, in the United States, we've done it by, by printing a lot of money and creating stock market bubbles. And there's been also money that's gone to help other parts of the economy, but, uh, you know, proportionally not as much as it could be. So the, the pandemic is, I think, cracked open all sorts of conversations and they are really about, about risk and about risk umbrellas. What should governments be doing? What should companies be doing? What should individuals be doing? And how can they work together to reinforce an environment that promotes good risk-taking and discourages bad risk-taking? A concept related to the risk umbrella is the, the risk ecosystem. Uh, and that's you know, similar to the social safety net, but it's, it's around whether countries support entrepreneurs uh, you know, credit access, uh, the kind of sets of regulations that uh, that allow smaller companies 
to to grow and to get a, a toehold. Uh, there are, you know, the, the kinds of protections create that are are provided to big companies versus small companies. Uh, the education system that provides employees that uh, you know that are educated once they're they're graduating, going to these companies. So lots and lots of questions about what's the right ecosystem that promotes enough good risk taking, which is you know calculated risks that help to create jobs, that help to grow the economy, and discourages moral hazard or you know risks that are you know bad or dangerous. You know risks that people know have too high a chance of going wrong, but they do it anyway because they know it's not going to affect them personally, um, or the government's going to bail them out. And so all of the all of these policy questions that are swirling around right now really are about risk, but they're not always being spoken of explicitly enough. There's a very interesting article in Axios this week, uh, and the headline was, you know, the world needs a chief risk officer. And uh, fascinating question, um, you know, risk officers has, has really only been a thing for, for 20, 30 years, and that role has been evolving. And there's a lot of debate over whether companies should have, you know, their risk department, or if if risk management should be more broadly integrated into the company, you know, again, I think those are not mutually exclusive. Um, but I think that this global approach to risk, to risk umbrella, risk ecosystem is also very important. Um, in the book, I talk with, I, I talk about a, a German scholar, Ulrich Beck, uh, who is, is absolutely amazing, he, or, or was, he passed away in 2015, unfortunately. And uh, I discovered him actually through my former Columbia professor, uh, Song Jin Han, who I saw when I was speaking in Seoul at a conference in 2017. And I went to visit him, I'm embarrassed to say 25 something years after Columbia, these, <laughs> these years just um, really uh, stack up quite quickly. So, you know, he taught a, a PhD seminar on democratic transitions and political economy um, at SIPA. And uh, so I went to visit him and he'd worked closely with, uh, with Ulrich Beck who came up with a concept called risk society. And his argument was that a long time ago, uh, risks were from nature. You know, you get eaten by a mountain lion or a boulder falls on your head or you get washed away by a flood. You know, some of those natural, um, natural disasters, floods are still here, of course. And then he said in modernity, we actually conquered a lot of these risks. I mean, you know, we've got air conditioning, so you're not going to die of heat exposure and, and all of these technologies and systems that were set up to, uh, to basically override the things that nature was doing to us. And he said that the very success of some of these technologies, of course, created what he's called a second modernity. And that is a set of risks that were primarily human created. When we come back to, to climate change, uh, as, as something that humans are contributing to, and we're, we're now catching up trying to deal with it. And uh, Beck called for a, a sort of a global cosmopolitan approach to dealing with some of these, uh, these really ex existential global risks. Um, a, a bit rosy eyed, um, but on the other hand, uh, the kinds of things he, were talking about, he was talking about are things that we actually uh, do need to be doing a lot more of. Uh, so there's, you know, again, this relationship between individuals, our individual risk decisions, and some of these, these global decisions. When it comes to climate change, one of the reasons people don't do as much as they could is that they don't feel a lot of sense of personal agency. I had a long running argument for, year, for years with a friend who said, I'm not going to give up my SUV because they're building coal plants in China. So it doesn't matter what I do, we're screwed anyway. And I think there is a certain sense of that with climate change, but the more people can become aware that people in other countries care about this too and are doing things about it, uh, the more people will be encouraged to become part of a, a global uh, movement to deal with some of these uh, existential risks. Um, so that's uh, the policy part of the book is actually, you know, most of it's really in a, in a couple of chapters, um, but I felt it was so important uh, to include and a lot, of, a lot of what I'm talking about too is understanding not just our own relationship to risk, 
you know, why we make the decisions that we do, what makes us more comfortable taking good risks and uh, you know, less likely to take dangerous risks, um, but to understand why other people are doing that too. And that's really, you know, it's, across, it's across countries, it's across cultures uh, in a work environment uh, it's it's about helping teamwork. Uh, it's been very interesting to see that in some groups, uh, everybody's got pretty much the same attitude towards risk, which actually increases risk. That means they're less likely to uh, to see flat red flags that are raised. They're less likely to be able to have a structured debate about different points of view. But if you have a you know a board of directors or a team where you've got people with different risk fingerprints, uh, different relationships with risk, different reasons for thinking the things that they do, you're much better set up to have a strong conversation uh, about the risk decisions that you're going to make as a group. And you know, if you're all engineers, or if you're all lawyers, or if you're all marketing people, uh, it's, it's worth thinking about that and bringing in someone new. And, and so risk empathy is about really understanding the risk attitudes of the people around you. If you're, if you're leading a team, it's incredibly important for, for helping to empower the people in your, in your group uh, to, to do what, you know, what's gonna be best for the, for the company. Uh, and finally, uh, risk literacy is another one of the, the concepts that I think is so important. You know, we've seen that in the COVID pandemic uh, with the, the wildly differing attitudes that people have, and even you know within communities and you know down the block from each other uh, about how much risk there you know there was and is, what risks they're willing to take or not, different attitudes about uh, the risk that you your behavior poses to the people around you, and uh, that really goes down to two things. It's one the the ability to to look at the probabilities that have been estimated of, of you, know, you getting sick, of you, you know, dying when you get sick. There's some very interesting research I cite in the book about um, how people, people surveyed by the Risk Policy Working Group uh, thought that you had a much higher chance than you know, the experts calculated of getting COVID and an even higher chance of dying from it if you got it than reality. But there wasn't a correlation between how much risk you thought there was and whether you wore a mask or social dis distance or did the other things that you're supposed to do. The difference was actually in the communication. It was whether the governments in those communities had communicated, here's something simple that you can do every day. This is not a big change and it works. And that message of e efficacy goes back to what I was talking about before about human agency that you know, for you to stand up and deal with a certain risk, you've got to feel that the actions that you're taking are, are worth the, the difference. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's a whole bunch of things. I always talk about, I often talk about risk as, as a kaleidoscope, this is constantly changing as you, as you turn it, or as, as a bunch of funhouse mirrors, because you know, when you look in the room, you change your perspective and the risk itself seems to change in its appearance and it's actually not just in its appearance, it's, it's like Schrodinger's cat, that the act of observing the risk actually changes the state of the risk. When you acknowledge that it's there, uh, when you seek the knowledge that you need, uh, when you come up with scenarios and think about it ahead of time, uh, you're, you've actually got the power to reduce the risk. And so that, that act of observing reduces the risk uh, in and of itself. Um, so it's, it's just absolutely fascinating when you start looking at it, when you look at it from an individual perspective or uh, organizational and then the, the policy environment. One of the most powerful comments that I got while talking about the gray rhino was in Milwaukee. I was giving a speech at a high school and one of the people in the room was, uh, she, it was one of the parents uh, who was a nurse. And this was when they were talking a lot about uh, taking down, you know, destroying Obamacare and she said that the number of patients who were coming in with stress-related health disorders went way up because they were so worried actually about whether they were gonna have their health care or not. And it was just fascinating to me. That was such a clear illustration of the, the connection between these big policy issues and individual issues. 
when I was at the World Policy Institute, one of the things that I, I tried most to do in, in the fellows that we recruited and in the, uh, you know, in the, the articles in the World Policy Journal and in the conversations that we had was to talk about policy in a way that a lot of people could relate to, that it's not just, you know, for wonk. And, uh, and this book is really trying to do the same thing, to kind of build that bridge between the, the policy community and the, the broader world and, you know, of course, businesses. So uh, that's the sort of introduction. And what I wanted to do now with the second part of this is to really have a conversation. Um, I've got a bunch of questions uh, teed up for all of you um, that I'm hoping we can be uh, lively enough. We've got a small enough group that we can do that. Um, but I wanted to start with the question I asked you a few minutes ago about um, what is risk? And uh, it's, you know, you can see if you look in the chat, there's such a, a wide range. Uh, Mara talks about operating in uncertainty. And I'm glad she brought that up actually, because um, one of the concepts in the book is, is actually the difference between risk and uncertainty. The sort of classical economics, financial definition of risk and uncertainty is that uncertainty is what you just like, there's no way of knowing. You just, you have no way of assigning a probability or anything. And risk is something that you can actually calculate the likelihood of. And that's a very slippery concept because you need it for, you know, for using insurance or other tools in risk management in, in commerce. I mean, that's, it's really what commerce was built on. And there are certainly some ways of calculating things. Uh, you know, insurance companies use actuarial tables to, to tell you, you know, how much longer I'm likely to live and you know, in turn, how much a premium on life insurance I might have to pay or, you know, health insurance, you know, for a non-smoker of my age, you know, what's the, the likelihood I'm going to have certain illnesses and how much is it going to cost? So some of those are, are reasonable in assigning probabilities or, you know, the weather report. There's like a reasonable chance that they're somewhere in the ballpark, but the way that we respond to those is totally different. Like so there are some people who will bring an umbrella if there's a 30% chance of rain and there are other people who won't bother if there's a 90% chance. And of course, we see things as binary. It either rains or it doesn't. Uh, so it's, it's just, it's fascinating. So a lot of people who are uncomfortable or who think they're uncomfortable with taking risks uh, are actually much more uncomfortable with uncertainty. It's just with, with not knowing the outcome. So I think that this technical financial definition of risk is actually not what most people use, uh, which goes back to my earlier point about people in, in different professions using completely different language. Um, you know, Yaman, again, so interrupt you. I thought of risk originally as just volatility. Because I'm being a financial professional, you think the first thing is how volatile is it? It's not necessarily negative or positive, and there's no fear in it. That's that's how I kind of thought about it. But as I read your book, it was pretty clear. There's a much broader definition of risk that's kind of built into the way you've looked at it, which has more purpose, I guess, in our lives. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting set of things. And also I meant to mention before and completely flaked, but you know, all of you, please feel free to just, you know, jump in if you have a, a question or, or comment, particularly now that we're in the, in the, in the more interactive portion of it. Um, but in, you know, in, in the answers to, to that question I had, you can kind of see something of, of what Habib was talking about. You know, Yalman has a, a you know, very value neutral, uh, uh, description, you know, calculation of the potential outcomes, which could be opportunity, could be risk. Because, because um, I'm almost finished with your book. So that's kind of the lesson I'm getting. You were Did cheating. Did I summarize it well or not? Yeah, I, I'm on chapter 13. So it's almost done. Awesome. Yeah. And, and others, you know, some people, somebody talks about an opportunity, um, a couple of, there seem to be a little bit more on, on you know, the downside rather than the upside. Some talking about getting out of your comfort zone and, and, and risk and uncertainty both do make a lot of people uncomfortable. Um, Michelle, in your research for the book, or just even in your day-to-day -day interactions, do you see lack of understanding sounds a little unfair to say, so forgive me, but, you know, I think if, a lack of understanding in terms of the opportunity that risk presents and that people are kind of tied 
they're like, you know, tied down by the uncertainty and in instead of looking at risk as, you know, a strategic opportunity. Because when I was going through your book, the thought that kept floating through is that people will take risks on a chessboard or a backgammon board, but thinking of it strategically for the same outcome in like work or finance or whatever, you don't see that as much. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, it's, one of my points is that, that we all bring our own biases to a particular risk decision. You know, some people are going to come at it thinking, oh, here's, here's an opportunity. Or, and, and some of this has to do with the conversation that's going on publicly. Um, you know, you look at the whole, you know, Robin Hood and, you know, the retail trading thing that's going on right now. And it's all about, you know, fear of missing out. And, you know, if you want, if you want reward, you have to take risk. And there's this idea of risk as being weighted much more towards the positive Thing and people are not thinking about the potential negative side, but then there are a lot of other people who will approach risk with this, you know, you know, instinctive sort of reflective with a negative fear. stigma, yeah. And so being aware of the biases that you bring to a risk conversation will allow you to help to change your settings. You know, if you know you're scared of stuff, look at your group of friends or peers. You know, who's somebody who's really confident, who you can, you know speak as a mentor or seek their, their input. Um, if you're the kind of person who leaps before you look, you know, bring into your inner circle some people who are a little bit more sober. I mean, it's, it's why you see all these tech startups, you know, founded by these, these 20 somethings in, in Silicon Valley, you know, mm -hmm. bring in a grown up as, when they're ready <laughs> for, the, for, the next, uh, for the next stage. So that's, it's a really good, a really good point. Um, but, but yeah, so I, I do have a bunch of questions for, for you guys, but I'll, before I get into that, if you, know, if you guys are, are super shy and not taking the risk of asking questions, I will uh, you know, draft I, all of you. But I did first want to give you all the chance to, uh, to, to ask uh, your own questions. Michelle, so um, I was yapping uh, all uh, for five minutes before I realized I was mute. Um, modern technology, the, t the risk of modern technology. Um, but no, when I was read, when I when I'm reading your book, I kept thinking of my own this risk decisions, right? And and whether I was risk averse, whether I was you know like all these the, the different ways you describe, and I always thought of myself as very risk averse, like that I don't like to take risks. But then the more examples you bring up, and 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 I put myself in those shoes, then I'm like, wait, wait, in some cases I took humongous risks. But I didn't realize I was taking them. I mean, I was a war correspondent, and and you know they were there were armies shooting at each other. I was caught in the middle and almost got blown up how many times? And yet I didn't see that as being very risky. And then, I, you know what I mean? It's like we also don't always realize whether we're taking risk or with what, like what what calculations we're doing, or if we're not doing calculations. Sometimes we're we're very risk. Um, um, aware, we're really looking what's the risk, and sometimes we just don't, it doesn't register, like you just do it, like how the same person can be in those two different situations, it, it's amazing, I mean, but I kept thinking of this and realizing this as I read through, because, you know, I, I can't put myself in any of those categories, because I've done all of them, you know, took crazy risk without thinking, and extreme calculations with before taking risks. Yeah, it's such a good point because um, you know that can be different in different parts of our life. And in fact, this whole I, I have a whole rant about the term risk averse. Um, that's talk about a person being risk averse in general. And first of all, we've got very different risk relationships in different parts of our life. The health decisions we make, career, finance, relationships, um, ethics, even you know recreation. You know I. You, you will not catch me skydiving. I'm sorry, I just don't see how that's fun. But I know a lot of people do. My cousin does and she broke her leg and then she used to ride horses and then she couldn't ride horses anymore. So maybe that's part of, of why you don't want to do that. But so first of all, you know, you can have very different uh, risk tolerances for different parts of your life. But the other part about this term risk averse, which often is thrown about, particularly aimed at women and millennials and, and not in a particularly complimentary way, um, but technically the term risk averse means that you, you, you'll take less risk, all other things being, being the same, 
And like, I'm sorry, the risk for me walking down the street at three in the morning down a dark alley is very different from someone, you know, a guy who's six foot three and 240 pounds. I mean, it's just not the same risk. Um, you know, social risk in meetings, there's some really interesting research about how uh, women are more likely than men to take social risks. But it's partly because the kind of it, uh, the dynamic of speaking out in meetings for women uh, often for our entire careers has meant taking more social risk. Um, you know, to be the only woman in a room full of men uh, is, you know, for anyone to be in a room full of people who are different from you is scarier. And, you know, women risk being ignored, they risk being ignored, and then the guy three seats down, he peeps your idea and everybody claps for, for him, uh, or you get called, you know, bossy or things like that. And so, in a, in a lot of cases, women are more practiced at taking social risks. And the more practice you have, the less risky it feels, and you get into your sort of funhouse mirror um, dynamic there. So, and the other part is very interesting. There were, there were some really big risk takers I talked to in the book, and the closing story I think was so powerful is Mark Pollock who went blind um, when he was uh, in his twenties and became the first blind man to race across the South Pole. And, uh, and then he later on, he fell out of a window when he was 29 and is, is in a wheelchair now. And he set out to like raise enough money to cure paralysis in his lifetime, which is crazy. But what was interesting talking to him was that he goes into, he would do these crazy adventure things but he would make so many preparations ahead of time that it was actually reducing the risk. And you know, so the risk of someone going to do these doing things without preparing is very different from someone who's doing it professionally. And so these you know, professional daredevils in many cases are, are not risk takers. They'll go down to, to the details. There's a professional skier uh, in the book who, who had the same uh, explanation. So it's, you know, your relationship with your risk actually changes the nature of the risk itself. Do we have any more questions before I throw some questions at you? Um, Michelle, uh, you, you mentioned earlier about uh, risk umbrella and creating a positive risk environment. I guess my question is what, what do you think should be the role of the media in fostering that? And um, the example I was thinking when you mentioned that was, this uh, Johnson and Johnson vaccine that was creating blood clot, I think in six people out of close to 6 million doses that was um, uh, provided. And when I think about it, it's basically one in a million chance that somebody will get it. Uh, whereas if you don't get vaccinated, you probably has a far more higher chance of dying from COVID. But yet, you know, just because the media was so focused on those six people and how the vaccine was creating uh, blood clot, a lot of people were really concerned about it. And so what, what, is your, what would be your comment on that? That's such a great question. Um, NPR had a, had a piece uh, on that and you know, about exactly that thing, about this you know, you know, failure to really look at things uh, empirically. And I think you know, there were some things saying that you know, women who are on the birth control, uh, on birth control pill already have a much higher risk of, of blood clots than the Johnson & Johnson thing. And, and media is, is so important. Ulrich Beck writes a lot about the role of media. And, and in some cases, this, this strange dance with governments in what he calls staging risk, you know, shaping what people see as risky or not. And you see it on all sorts of policy issues. I, I spent many years writing a lot about immigration, particularly post 9-11 uh, immigration and security issues and how the media really got sucked into these sort of, uh, you know, government homeland security narratives about what was risky or not. Uh, there was uh, there was a debate several years ago about about you know I think it was about the people coming in at the border, um, and you know, continued debate about oh there might be a, a terrorist coming across the border, and there were studies showing I forget the exact numbers but it was it was crazy like the risk of being killed in a terrorist act uh, by a refugee just like so minuscule, particularly compared to the risk of being killed in a terrorist act uh, carried out by like a white American guy, or, you know, supremacist. And of course, there's a lot of concern right now about uh, domestic terrorism that is finally starting to get its, its due. But um, there's lots and lots of, uh, so many examples of media pouncing on whatever is emotionally resonant at the moment. And uh, I, I quote a lot from Paul Slovich, who's like the, you know, the 
the big guy in, in risk perception, social psychologist, very, very uh, eminent. And he talks about all these factors that affect how risky we judge something to be. Uh, and those include, you know, things that you'd like naturally dread, if you know how much of a dread factor something is, how emotionally uh, resonant it is, how familiar it is or not, how much knowledge you have about it, how much control you feel you have about it. So all of these risk perceptions have something to do with your own background, some with the nature of the risk itself. And in terms of the emotionally resonant part of it, um, it's, it's really important to see what the media does with it. And particularly in the last couple of decades, decades as it's become more entertainment oriented and, and you know, less fact oriented. So I'm, I'm super glad you brought it up because the media has a big responsibility and a, and a much smaller part of the media than in the past uh, has actually been, you know, stepping up to it. Thank you. Is there a society, Michelle, this is a question I had, that kind of got the right balance between the risk umbrella and institutional responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the risk ecosystem to encourage taking risks? You know, I think it's um, it's hard to find one that's it's like a good uh, a good example, but I think in general, I think Europe has tended to do a a fair amount better with with social safety nets. I mean, Scandinavia is often uh, held up as a good uh, as a good example. Uh, I think that there have been some you know very interesting things like you know the German unemployment uh, policies that you know they they support companies to, to help with with uh, with salaries so that they don't have to lay people off. And we we tried a version of that in the U.S. last year, which which didn't work out quite so well. Um, and, and I think that they're different in different countries. I mean, there's some things that would fly in Europe that just would not fly in certain parts of the US. Um, you know, I think all, all countries could stand, uh, you know, sort of reevaluation of, uh, of where they are. And I think it changes from time to time. You know, very interesting, Germany, in the early stages of the pandemic, you know, was was praised as one of the countries that was doing better in you know, reducing caseloads and deaths and sing, things like that. And then when it came to vaccine rollout, you know, they were much slower. And that had to do with all sorts of things, including, you know, the European Union dynamics and their different levels of confidence in the vaccine. And I think in the US, they saw the vaccine as a, as a silver bullet. And so I think part of that is it's why we were so sloppy earlier on, is it just sort of counting on this thing? And they were much more skeptical of it in Europe. And, you know, so, so it really depends and it can change from, you know, from month to month, from year to year and in different parts of, of a country as, as well. Uh, I think it's also uh, interesting to look at say like credit availability uh, there, there are many cases, and there's, there's, uh, there's a story in the book about Boston uh, Impact Initiative and other places that are trying to get more credit to the communities that need more credit to create jobs, to take more good risks, uh, but don't have access to it. So that's, that's more of an, an aspirational uh, uh, area, but it's, it's something I, I don't think anyone's doing, doing great at right now, but that I think would be a super, super, super thing to do. And there's, there's a risk that we're about to be attacked by imaginary hall monsters, but I'm very well protected. <laughs> um, there's another question about if there's a way to gauge whether outcomes are better from a risk uh, perspective when you have diverse teams. Um, I haven't seen, um, I can't think of like a specific study to to cite, but there are people people do believe that um, that uh, there's a correlation. It's it's similar to the research around um, you know boards that have a higher percentage of women tend to outperform. Uh, and I know that there there are a lot of people working on a diverse the diverse decision making. There's often more friction in the process. I think partly because people are uncomfortable talking about you know, other perspectives and having their own views challenged, uh, which is why homogeneous groups are, are so, so dangerous for um, you know, in, in failing to recognize risks. 
Um, so I, I haven't seen a, a, I can't come up with right now a very specific study, but I know that there's a lot of, of work uh, that's, that's been done in that area. You have another question? I know well, we're uh, short of time. Um, I, don't know, I just thought if you talk a little bit about your own risk decisions personally, Sinsipa, and kind of how you built what you write in the book into your own personal life. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, um, before Charlotte, I want to throw out um, two questions that I hope that you'll all uh, take with you. And you know, the first is, you know, what's the biggest risk that you've ever taken? And the second quest question is, what's the biggest risk you've decided against? You'll actually often find there's a very close relationship between those, as, as I'll tell you. Um, uh, I want to start actually with a SEPA risk story. Um, I, uh, when I started SEPA, I immediately got this, this job at a, a Dominican newspaper writing in Spanish, uh, which was a learning curve. And uh, I had told the publisher I didn't want to do reporting. Uh, in fact, I was supposed, supposed to be doing page layout. It was the early days of, of digital uh, page layout. And I said, because I don't want to flunk out of graduate school, so please don't, you know, I'm not going to report. Um, but then he knew I was really interested in Haiti. So President Aristide was coming to speak at the UN. He's like, you want a UN press pass? You want to go hear Aristide speak? You know, he, he knew which buttons to press. So I show up at the UN and I, you know, I write about the speech. And of course, a week later, Aristide got kicked out. And so the publisher called me into his office and he says, what are you doing for midterm break? This is my first semester at SEPA. And he's like, do you want to go to Haiti and cover the coup over midterm break? And and I was like, yeah, I didn't even have to think about it. Um, so I marched into the dean's office with a list of my classes and said, look, I'm going to be in Haiti. Um, I'm not entirely sure the airport's going to be open when I want to go home. So if I don't show up, can you tell my professors where I am, please? <laughs> and uh, so it, that all worked out well. It actually ended up being part of my first book. Um, but, you know, one of the big risks, you know, Habi was talking about how I was, uh, you know, overworking when I was in SIPA and, um, you know, doing, you know, I did sleep in three semesters. I did college in, you know, in, in, um, in college in the whole four years, but I did high school in three years. And that sort of like overworking was a big risk that I wasn't paying attention to. And I ended up eventually uh, paying a big price for it. I, I got quite sick, was diagnosed with, with chronic fatigue syndrome. And uh, I decided to quit my job at International Financing Review which, you know, for journalism was very well paid. I was, you know, knocking my student loans out of the ballpark and, you know, filling up my 401k. And I took a six week medical leave and I came back and uh, I'd had all these plans about, you know, I was going to go to Argentina and open a bureau and do all this stuff. And I just said, you know what, if I do that, I'm going to get sick again. And so that was the biggest risk I didn't take. You know, I, I didn't, I decided not to risk my health because I felt that, I needed to be doing what I felt my biggest purpose was. And a good friend of mine at the Wall Street Journal was like, Michelle, you can do so much better than this. And you know, I listened to him. And so I ended up quitting my job, which for a lot of people, in fact, when I first started being asked this question, I'd say, well, this was you know, the biggest risk. And once I told them the story, I went, wait a minute, that wasn't the biggest risk. You know, the biggest risk was the putting my health at risk. And that's really informed pretty much everything I've done since then is like really looking at what I'm supposed to be doing, you know, what my skills are, what I have to offer to the world, what, you know, what people value, what I can make a living on, of course. Um, and that's really guided everything. It's, it's, you know, when I decided to, to take the job to turn around the World Policy Institute when it was on life support, um, it was what was on my mind when I decided to leave the think tank world and, and go back to writing full time, which of course is also, you know, speaking and consulting and workshops and things. But, um, but so that's why I ask you those two questions, you know, what's the biggest risk and what's the biggest risk you didn't take. And when you're asking about a risk, ask yourself riskier than what? Uh, because it's always, it's always a choice. Um, and if you're not making that comparison, you know, is it riskier to, you know, stay in this corporate job with the good salary and the 401k and all the benefits or stuff, but you're stagnating and your, your boss is a control freak who can't make a decision and, and, you know, you have no upside is, you know, is that the safe choice 
or is going and doing something new and uncomfortable the less risky thing, even though to the outside world, it looks more risky. Well, <clears throat> I guess we're almost out of time, Michelle, um, but this is a, a fascinating topic and something for us to all think about personally, professionally, and in, in the world around us. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your work tonight and um, giving us some things to think about. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to me. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you.